Welcome back to Beyond the Helmet. I'm your host, Steve McGrath. And if this podcast does nothing else, I want to be able to have people relate to a story where they know that they can go and achieve things, right? I'm trying to be able to talk to guys that have done it at the highest level and be able to take things from their story that people can then apply to their lives. I want people to realize that their dreams aren't that far away and we're going to use sports as a vehicle to get there. So for me, going to school at UMass Amherst, literally the first football game I go to, I'm a freshman, fall of 08. The biggest, baddest dude on the team is Jeremy Miles. And today I get a chance to talk to him. So Jeremy, man, being a UMass alum, you were like the one dude I got to actually watch in real time and be like, all right, you know what? We got some talent in Amherst. So thank you for taking the time today. How's it going? Everything is amazing, man. Like you said, it that so much time has passed. Where, where, where the heck did time go? <laughs> yeah, that's still trying to wrap my head around it. <laughs> too fast. It's going. I was way what two thousand eight. Right? It's two thousand twenty one. <laughs> now you make me feel old, though. The, the one thing I don't like about the, this this moment is I feel a little old now. <laughs> I, well, at least you know that I'm as old as you are going through the process. Um, but man, you know, it, it's, it's crazy because again, for me to be able to see someone and I thought it was just, you know, it's UMass, it's not a big time school, but guys from UMass go pro and they do things. They play professionally outside of just playing there collegiately. Uh, Vlad Dukas, obviously, you know, high pick from that uh, era as well. You know, Vic Cruz, of course. So, you know, it was good to see good things coming out of Western Mass. Um, so man, from the jump because it has been a minute since then. Do you mind just talking a little bit about what you've been up to recently and how you've been able to sort of change your gears for what, what you want to pursue in life after being a pro athlete? Yeah, I mean, well, so initially I transitioned out of the NFL and I transitioned. They had like an amazing NBA program going um, for, you know, some, some of the athletes that were in that transitional period. So, you know, I got the, the feedback ended up doing that. So I did my MBA at the University of Miami, um, which was, you know, obviously I can't complain about being in Miami doing, uh, doing anything. So um, I love my experience, man. I had some amazing professors uh, end up getting my, my MBA. So I wanted to really, you know, start transitioning into some type of leadership role in business, um, you know, as I was like transitioning and finding myself. So, um, you know, that came about, like I said, I, you know, I met, I, I ended up getting my master's and then I actually like from Miami, you know, I was transitioning from Baltimore. So when I finished my, my um, master's, I actually transitioned up back up this way. So I actually live currently live in Windsor, Connecticut, have a, you know, home. Um, and, you know, when I got up to this area, you know, one of my last classes program was a, um, a real estate um, tax class. So, I mean, I just really, really like liked everything. It made sense. I could apply it to my life. So I took some of those principles and I was just like, let me, you know, transition into like real estate. So I transitioned into like acquiring properties. And then, um, you know, I learned the actual like general contracting, um, you know, that that whole um, transition and through general contracting, I actually, so I, I own a restaurant lounge in Hartford, God bless me. And actually two of my partners are Shannon James, the all time, you know, interception leader at uh, UMass, which you, you would love to. So I'll put you guys in contact. You guys need to like link up really soon. Um, and then uh, Alfonso Gu. So we all um, co-own this restaurant right in Hartford. And it's actually like, what, what's so crazy about it, we started from scratch. We started from um, a napkin actually, <laughs> you know, just an idea on a paper. We always go back to that paper. And uh, now we actually have become one of the lounges in, in the area. Um, shoot, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, we're kind of popular in New England now, man, which is which is really cool. So, you know, obviously for me, like that transition wasn't, you hear about some, you know, really bad scenarios with guys that, you know, didn't really transition well. Mine was actually like a pretty, it has been a pretty good success story between the real estate and then, you know, the restaurant lounge and hopefully being able to ex continue to expand. So, like I said, it's just been, you know, for me, it's been kind of like, unreal. Like sometimes I still have to pinch myself because I think I got out of the NFL in the right time I don't have any you know major head issues or major like injuries so and I transition into what I love doing now and they say when you love doing you know when you transition into something that you love doing it's not work so I don't feel like you know we're going to work and it's been amazing bro 
Man, living the dream. I'm so glad to hear it. But uh, it sounds like you didn't necessarily, you know, before college have like a strong idea of like, hey, I want to do X if football doesn't work out. So you kind of happen to fall into something that you really love. Yes, bro. I, I kind of literally like it just kind of fell into place. And I just kind of naturally gravitated towards like some of my strengths. Man. So I, I really, like I said, I, the, the craziest thing is I think the NFL, when you do have opportunity to play, right? Um, you never know when it's going to end. But I think a lot of guys struggle with identifying with football for so long, for such a long time in your life, that when it really finally happens, it's such a hard transition to make. For <laughs> sure. the grips with reality, like, I, I, yeah, like this is really like that time is really gone. So that was tough. That I'm not going to lie to you, bro. That, that time was, that was not the best time for me as far as that transitional you know, awareness of the new person that I, I would have to be, become. Well, I, I mean, how many guys walk off on their own terms? So, you, you know, there's only like one Tom Brady, one Peyton Manning, like almost like 99% of guys, eventually just the phone doesn't ring. So if you don't leave on your terms, then man, it, it's got to be a hard pill to swallow. So I'd imagine that that's like a, a tough one, two year process for just about everyone that's ever put on the pads. Maybe yes, longer than, yes. than just two years, but like at least one to two years. At least, at the very least. <laughs> but um, what's cool is, you know, when you build that camaraderie in the locker room, you know, now it's like a new locker room for me, but I still have some of my guys that, you know, I built that with at UMass. And obviously I'm talking to one of my guys from UMass now. So um, I think like you don't realize how deep those bonds go um, when you're, you know, actually playing or you're in school and you don't know how deep those bombs are going to your life but it's cool man all these things these dots start to connect and like I said even with you now man I'm glad to see you doing this podcast man and reaching out to guys and it's just an amazing thing oh thanks I appreciate it but you know one thing about your story that you know, having that network of guys yeah you have strong UMass ties but like you have ties to Cincinnati and the guys that you played with there you could have ties from Baltimore guys. Obviously, you're from the New Jersey area. Well, oh, wait, you have ties to the, the Naval Academy. So it's like now you're at a point where there's these, um, and that's not to discount the, the New York Giants part of your career too. So it's like you have at one point, you've had a chance to connect with all these different people. And now it's just uh, a matter of how do you string that all together? In a way, I think that's better than being in one spot for your entire career because you just connect with so many more people by virtue of being in different locker rooms. That's correct, man. That's correct. So um, I guess the you know advice there is like don't take those connections for granted. Man. Don't take those relationships. Don't take those opportunities. Network with people and build. Don't take it for granted. So I'm glad I did. You know, have a pretty um, good relationship with a lot of guys, man. So a lot of you know, um, I actually just had uh, Carlos Dunlap um, and then Anthony Levine, um, my Bengal counterpart, my Ravens counterpart. They both came in, um, you know, came up to Connecticut to celebrate my birthday. But, you know, obviously they wouldn't really be in this area for anything. But, you know, now, you know, giving them awareness that this is a cool place, man. And, um, you know, hopefully one day I can get these guys to come to UMass and, and speak, and, you know. So, Listen, if you like can said, get man, it's, it's, it's you can get them to Connecticut. You can get them to UMass. Because listen, Connecticut, for all, I, I was born and raised in Massachusetts, so I, I got a certain way I feel about Connecticut. But if you can get people there, you can get them the extra hour and a half north. <laughs> like we don't we don't have to go into details of how you feel about Connecticut, man. I don't, hey, I don't hey! To... <laughs> I, now that I know that that you have a, a a lounge there, you got you got the whole thing going on. Like, okay, now I, I'm coming around. Now m maybe I was wrong. So I, I, I you know, th nothing's absolute. So I did, I stand to be corrected. So are you? My question is: Are you in the area still? Are you? Are you? Um, oh, I'm born and raised in Massachusetts. Else. Okay. And where yeah. you currently reside? Still Massachusetts. Still, still Massachusetts. I, I'm in, yeah, I'm in Norwood, which is just, you know, between Boston and um, Foxborough, you know, stadium there. So you have no excuse not to come to, to you know, the restaurant? No, no. I'll, I, I'll figure out a way. To... <laughs> no excuse. But, um, yeah, like, like I said, bro, it's just, it's definitely been, you know, um, I think 
we take time to really appreciate all the, the blessings in your life, man. Like I just, like I said, the the people from the people to all the experiences. Um, I'm just, you know, I guess an amazing time in my life where I appreciate everything, now, man. You know, even times like this and opportunities to, you know, to, um, you know, reconnect with you, bro, and kind of go over like, you know, the current state of where I'm at. It's, it's a blessing. So. You know, there's really two ways that I think about you know, how a pro athlete could approach life after being a pro athlete, you know, and one is, man, you are so used to having a schedule, you know, exactly when to be where and what to do that you would make a great employee because man, you are good at sticking to a schedule. But on the other end, you are so programmed to be an overachiever, put in the time, put in the work that you'd make a great entrepreneur. Did you have any sort of, uh, you know, internal struggle of figuring out, hey, do I want to be in charge of everything? Or hey, would I rather just show up and do exactly what I'm supposed to do? I, I think for me, it was very clear that um, I wasn't going to be one that could sit in the office and take, you know, too much instruction. <laughs> so for me, my, you know, it made my transition even faster, just knowing that, you know, corporate world probably wouldn't be good for me, just, you know, personality wise, and like, sometimes just wanting to you know, act on some of my ideas and things like that. Um, I kind of naturally um, gravitated towards uh, entrepreneurship. So for me, like I said, like, um, you know, some people, like you said, that structure is amazing for them. And obviously like through Naval Academy, through the structure of, you know, college football, NFL football, just all the scheduling and everything, they, they gave me, um, they all gave me, um, you know, great qualities. But for me, I, I just always had the entrepreneurial spirit like since, since I was young. So it just, it just happened naturally and it was just the perfect transition for me. But I would say, you know, everything that comes with being an entrepreneur <laughs> and um, some of the struggles, it's clearly not for everybody. <laughs> for sure, it goes without um, saying, right? My advice, yeah, no, I, I don't think that people realize, you know, I think like anything, you see the glitz and the glamor on TV of everyone's success. You know, if you looked at my restaurant now before you saw it, everything that we went through. It took us about a year just to get approved um, through zoning and planning in the city of Harvard. So if you look at everything that we've been through relative to our success now, you know, you would think you would think it just, you know, happened overnight, but even that was a process and it's always, you know, issues, daily issues, you know, just like life. But I think one of the main um, characteristics and qualities that's take from football, just the variance, right? And that, that will to never, never accept failure. So even when we had difficult moments at, at the restaurant where, you know, we kind of scratching our head and I'm like, damn, is this for me? Do I really want to keep doing it? I'm like, it's just never an option. Like um, that mentality of being a champion, like you were talking about and, and that will to, to, to succeed that you know about, um, it kind of helped me, you know, transition into the workplace <laughs> So as an owner now. Right. Now, I'm sure you heard there's a little thing called COVID has been going on. So in terms of <laughs> in terms of having a restaurant, right, of all things that were affected, I, I mean, how hard was it for you to kind of roll with those punches? Because even today, you know, 16 months or whatever later, it's like one day, literally one news story could come out. The next day, it could contradict itself. I mean, it must have been an incredible ridiculous journey of just trying to do everything possible to be able to stay open, have a safe place. I, I mean, not that you need a, I'm not asking for any details, but just on a high level, how tough had it been to navigate that? And how much do you credit th that sort of champion mindset of being like, you know what, we're going to find a way, we're going to find a way, we're going to find a way. To be honest, I think that might be the only reason why we made it through. Like, if you look at all the there were a lot of very successful restaurants that went out of business, you know, because of this COVID, <laughs> this COVID thing. So COVID, the intensity level that, that COVID came uh, with, <laughs> you know, as far as attacking our industry, especially the restaurant industry, just I came out, as COVID came out swinging. And, you know, we, um, a, lot of, a lot of guys didn't get back up from the canvas. So for us, like you said, for, for me in, in the restaurant, you know, being a leader now, um, I think one of the most important things for me was kind of and what I, um, you know, gravitated towards was when I was a captain at UMass, you know, and I was in 
I was a captain on, you know, every NFL team that I've been on. It's just, you know, how I think a, a true leader is defined by, you know, how you react to, um, how you react when things go wrong for adversity. And obviously I feel like COVID was probably the biggest adversity that you could go through in, in the restaurant industry. So, you know, you know, having, having that adversity set in and having those principles, having experience with, you know, now, you know, the season is on the line with the Ravens now our season's on the line and, you know, having that, that game, so an interception, you know, you know, going back to UMass and, you know, you know, transitioning into this uncertainty of making it to the playoffs and having to go make that big play to, to, you know, wheel our team into the, to the playoffs. And now, you know, as a restaurant owner, like, you know, still having to operate and function with the type of um, confidence and, you know, the type of intensity level, even when you feel like the world is collapsing on you. It's, I feel like it's all the same principles and it's only one way to actually succeed through all these things. And that's like to have that champion mindset. So for me, like it just all came back to a natural place. And for my team and people that look, you know, up to me during this 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 crazy ass COVID time, we made sure that there was no questioning of, of if, if success was gonna be, you know, or failure was gonna be optional, should I say. It was, failure just wasn't gonna be optional. You know, if you're on my team, we, we, we don't accept that, so. So you were, you were really, you were, you've been a captain for every team you've played for? Every single team I've played for. I, I mean, that's pretty wild. Um, and obviously I knew you were at UMass, um, but like you didn't necessarily know that to be true, at, you know, for the, your time in the NFL. Um, so I mean, that, that being said, obviously there's something about you and how you carry yourself to be able to win over the confidence of, you know, not just, you know, teammates at UMass where you were, you know, a, a man among boys in a lot of regards, but in the NFL, right. When those physical differences are so much smaller and it's more about the, the mental aspect, your personality, your character, it, I would imagine that you probably didn't need a lot of coaches to sort of help push you along to like help you do what you needed to do. But that being said, when you think back on it, I mean, even going back to, uh, you know, coach green you know, back at um, the Navy days, I, I mean, do you have any coaches that you would really point to to say, like, kind of help mold you along the way to become, you know, this successful entrepreneur that you are now? I think um, it's so funny that you brought up coach green, like, like um, probably one of my most influential coaches, uh, I would say just because um, he probably probably showed me the most clear, you know, definition of like when, because I was young and I was playing and I was playing early, he knew, you know, all the stressors and everything that, that I would have to endure. So he already prepared me like <laughs> before then. So he, so when I say Coach Green was hard on me, like I, I think he took that to the next level with me. Um, but it helped prepare me because, you know, it was nothing that was going to phase me. You know, he, he already threw the, you know, the whole book at me. So for me, um, he was like the first person transitioning from high school to really like, um, I think put a full, put his, you know, all of his trust into me and say like, you know, I, I, I believe that you, you can, you know, help me take this thing to the next level. So I transitioned cause I actually played linebacker in, in, um, in high school. Um, so he was the first person that made that transition to safety. And um, like I said, for me, like, I wasn't even thinking about that. So, you know, that position, how he envisioned me kind of like helped me um, put, put me in position to be where I am. Um, I would say probably another very influential person would be um, Don Brown. <laughs> Same thing, intensity level is, is through the roof. Obviously you, you witnessed a couple of, you know, some of our games and uh, um, just that deep, like the way that we play defense with Don Brown and the physical nature that we play defense helped transition to when I got to the AFC North and, you know, playing with the Bengals and the Ravens. And they say, you need to bring another chin strap, you know, when you play in this division. Um, I think like all these things helped prepare me. I think probably in my opinion, maybe the most influential coach will probably be um, John Harbaugh. He just, you know, I think because of, the way that he approached the game as far as just, you know, as a leader being so accessible though, making himself, you know, accessible, all the players to feel like, 
you know, he, he would come in. I, one thing that he would always do, he would come in every week and sit with a different person every single time they sat down to eat. So every player would feel like there's a special connection between me and this man. You know, it's not like he's like one of those coaches that just hover above everybody or one of those leaders that, you know, are never present. Um, and like some of those principles, I, you know, I've, I'm transitioning into my restaurant and just making people feel like, you know, we are on the same level, you know, and, um, you know, th that nobody is bigger than the team. And, and, you know, when they say like nobody, when you look at, you know, an amazing organization and you can't tell who the leader is, that's an amazing thing. So, I, like I said, I, I think probably John, Bar John Harbaugh was probably like the most influential uh, coach that I had. <clears throat> that's awesome and that doesn't surprise me so uh, this is in no way a slight against Marvin Lewis I know you're not talking negatively about him just by omitting him but I've heard I've talked to a lot of former Bengals guys who have a lot of great things to say about what made coach Lewis such a, a great coach and it was that he cared a lot about the community and guys outside of the game so we, and you're shaking, you're nodding your head for for anyone that's listening and doesn't see this. Um, so, what then is it about what makes a successful coach? Do you have to? That connection has to be there with the guys. Obviously, everything you just said about Coach Harbaugh, it seems to an extent, Coach Lewis was trying to do the same things, maybe did it in a different way. But it, at the end of the day, is it just that bond? It, does that transcend scheme or any any other trait that you could possibly throw out there? Um, I just think like in my opinion, I just think there's like tiers of you know, I guess coaching and you know how coaches get through to their players and generally the championship coaches usually do something a little different. Um, you know, you kind of see that across the board. Um, sure. So I I just believe. Not that, you know, uh, Lewis is, because he's a phenomenal coach. Um, I think I think probably the, the thing in Baltimore that made that the culture a little different is probably, you know, when people feel more, like I said, when players feel more like the coach is someone that they, you know, is on the same level and, you know, is, um, I guess you would say, very involved in, like you said, that person, like feeling like they care about you, you know, care about you as a person, you know. So those things that you can do to, you know, what what are things that you can do to work on, you know, building that relationship. And I think that the difference with Harbaugh in general is the fact, and and I would say Don Brown on the collegiate level, is they really focus on that and they really hone in on that. And I think, in my opinion, when you make people feel like you would do anything for them, you get more out of your players. You know, and when they feel like, when your players feel like, regardless of how tough things get, you will never like abandon or desert them. People in general, I just feel like they tend to do more for you. So I, I for my, I think my, what, you know, my um, extraction from exactly what you were talking about is just the fact that, you know, as a coach, my advice would be, you know, if you want to take it to the next level with guys, figure out how, how do you, enhance that component yeah i, I still don't understand how 100 percent. i still don't understand though how umass got coach brown because that just didn't seem to i don't know it's like his resume is up here and he's like okay i'll come to umass and then just jumps to michigan or wherever he went after like oh oh yeah that makes more sense nothing yeah, against umass man. i love the Minutemen, but I, I mean he he's just he's cut from a different cloth you know he's 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 cut from a completely different Boss, and I'm you know, blessed to be, you know, to take nuggets from him and and, and to feel his leadership and, and know what you know an amazing, amazing leader looks like. And like I said, between him, between you know Harbaugh, um, Buddy Green, you know guys like that, um, they, they took a lot of time out. I think the common thing with these guys is they took a lot of time out and a lot of personal time and invested in guys to make them feel like they were special. And that's something that you just see kind of across the board with amazing coaches or amazing, amazing leadership. <clears throat> Definitely. Now, I, I do just want to ask you a little bit about the business side of the NFL, because I think it's easy as a fan to be like, oh, you know, Jeremy played for this amount of years. He played for these teams. But realistically, you live a journey. You lived a journey that most guys 
that play have. And that is sort of like, it's a, it's like a year to year deal. It's a one year deal. Basically um, when you're, you know, unless you are a star on the team, as you've seen, you can very easily be cut. You know, you put on the practice squad, you literally never know when you're called up, when you're released, how do you try to do the best job that you can be a professional, keep your head, you know, screwed on straight while basically never really knowing, am I going to be, you know, playing next week's at times. And then even year to year, am I going to be in Cincy or am I going to be, you know, trying to see if one of 31 other teams will have me on. Man, I mean, I, you know, I, I started, I think, you know, in my opinion, to answer that question, it's all a mentality. I, I started as an undrafted player. You know, obviously there was a lot of speculation now we'll get drafted higher, whatever. That, that didn't happen. <clears throat> and being starting off undrafted and, you know, not having the same opportunities as other guys that are drafted, um, I think the, the number one thing that helped me succeed would just be, like, I never got comfortable. I always had a chip on my shoulder, you know, and regardless six were telling me about if, you know, if I made a team or if I would be a starter and have an opportunity to start in game, none of that mattered to me because I understand the business of football and the business of, you know, most professional sports is what have you done for me lately? <laughs> you know? So if you don't keep answering that question, right. And if that question isn't a sound, like I've done some amazing things then you know, you, the potential for you to be released is always high. It doesn't matter who you are. So for me, I just always took it and I always said, you know what? I always have this chip on my shoulder. One, because, you know, for I'm a competitor. And for me, you know, not being drafted or having other guys be drafted above me, it's kind of like when you look at uh, Tom Brady's story, right? And that just put, you know, that inner fire just, uh, that, that pissed me off that, you know, and, and, and to be honest with you, I ended up, having a longer career than a lot of guys that were drafted ahead of me, you know, and, and for those oh, totally. reasons, because I, you know, for me, like I said, I had that fire inside and I had a chip on my shoulder and I never ever wanted to be comfortable or wanted to feel comfortable. Cause I knew that the moment that I did would be the moment that, you know, I probably would, would be packing. <laughs> it, and the Bengals deserve a lot of credit because they seemingly have done a very good job at finding undrafted free agents. I mean, the Patriots I, being a little biased from this area, you know, I know a thing or two about some of the guys that they've been able to find, but um, you know, Vinny Ray came on the podcast and he, I, I don't know if he was the same class or if he was the year before. We, we were the same exact draft class. We were both undrafted. I, I mean, come on. Like, are you kidding me? That that's insane. So Vinny yeah. I, amazing it, guy too. He's. Did you know he's now the team chaplain? I did the Bengals. Not, but but I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, so uh, you know, bef before we wrap this up, though, I, I had one last question for you, and it's just that there's something to me particularly stressful when I see that someone transferred out of Navy. How much pressure? Like once you commit to Navy, they're like, really, man? Like you're you're gonna go? You're not you're not gonna see this through? How hard was that for, for you to navigate that process? Um, you know, I think that I think the most tough part about that process was the fact that um, I had such a promising year, right? Such that statistically, as a freshman, I was like one of the first freshman to ever like really start that many games, and you know it, it, that was unheard of at the time. So it was a lot of pressure that came with what would I do the next season? Would it, would it be a fluke? Yeah. And I think it was a lot of people that know kind of what, what that would look like for the next season. So, um, you know, and the fact that, you know, when I, when I made that change, I would, I would, the thing about it was I was doing really well with everything. I just, it wasn't for me, like the military lifestyle. I wanted to go to college. I wanted to, you know, be, be a no college student. I, I didn't really want all the restrictions and everything that, you know, were imposed. So, um, you know, when I wanted to make that transition, it was kind of like for them, it was just kind of like sudden for them. But for me, it was on my heart. Um, and I don't know, you know, from at that time, you know, where, where did they receive it? Like, heck no. You know, did they make that process like very hard? Of course. They, I think what they were, what they wanted to do in that process was for me to rethink it, you know, have time, you know, rethink it. But my heart was already set. So, sure. you know, once you, once you have your heart set on something, man, it's it, keeping you in another scenario would, would be a uh, just, just, 
this trust, this honor for, for everybody involved. So I knew that I needed to, to, to do and pursue what my heart was telling me to do. And, you know, when I sat down with, with uh, Buddy Green and those guys, Paul Johnson, um, once they really got the feel for it, like how passionate I was about having like a normal college, college life. And, and even like when I transitioned and made that transition, it wasn't like, you know, I was sitting there and I just had all these things lined up. I just, I just was like, you know, I'm taking a leap of faith regardless. I think because of that leap, you know, because uh, one, once um, U, UMass was notified and some of the other colleges were notified, like, you know, it was like wildfire. So Coach Brown literally just flew right out to my house and the rest was just. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Um, well, man, to, to wrap this up, I got this little thing called the gauntlet. I got a couple quick hitter questions, man. I, I want your knee jerk reaction to a couple things, starting with what's most important, having the number one offense and number one defense. Number one defense all day. Dark side. It's all about that defense. <laughs> now, when, when you, you think back on it all, do you have a favorite football memory? Favorite football memory. I think um, my my favorite football memory was that so Baltimore 2014 literally like we were on the cusp of the playoffs um, against the Chargers. Um, really, you know, I went back into you know the deep half and the game was on the line. Quarterback put it up in the air, made the interception. I'm sorry, uh, against against the Chargers, yeah, uh, made the interception reception and um man that that moment stuck with me for a long time because if you remember back to that that year we were on the cusp we if we would lost that game we wouldn't have made the playoff so you know what that did for the organization you know I don't think that people understand all the pressures of of <laughs> what the organization goes through when they don't make a playoff you know sure so I knew how much that was mean to coach Harbaugh and the rest of the staff Ozzy Newsom and everybody so that moment was a special moment I think that we all will, will take for a long time. And um, of course it was on a professional level <laughs> and um, obviously a little money involved. So <laughs> that's never a bad deal either. Fair enough. Um, Pre-game ritual, was there anything that you had to do? Oh man, so so my pre-game ritual, one, I had to always play like, like one of my favorite gospel songs before I hit the field. You know, I, I, I didn't care, like, if I had to, you know, go to the training room or whatever, if I had a lot of tests before, I always made it, ha, always had to make sure that I listened to that one, that one gospel track before I hit that field. And that kind of, like, would just, you know, put me at, at ease, even if I was, you know, going through a lot of stress. <clears throat> you are far from the only person that said that there was a specific gospel song that they had to listen to. Man, listen, <laughs> man, you you talked about all the pressures and, and everything. So, you know, the world, you know, has a tendency to put a lot of pressure on people and kind of, you know, see how people react to that pressure. And I, and I really do feel like it's all, you know, we're, we're all evaluating on how, you know, because we all go through a lot of pressure in different moments of our lives. How do you respond to adversity? You know, and that defines yeah. That's the only question that matters. How do you respond? <laughs> Players or scheme, which is most important? Player or scheme? Yeah. I think, I think, I think, uh, player by far. All right. Fair enough. You know, I got a, what's that? Go ahead. Without a special player, without special players, we'd be done. Jimmy's or Joe's over the X's and O's is, is uh, another way people have answered that, which is saying players over scheme. Um, so I, I just have to ask a, <laughs> I got to ask a UMass question though. Was there a favorite place on campus while you were there? Any particular place, whether it was to go out, get a bite to eat, place on campus, it, does anything stand out as a favorite? Well, it, well I, if I can answer two favorites, I would say the monkey bar, <laughs> which was, you know, obviously you, you, you remember the monkey bar. <laughs> a lot of memorable nights at the monkey bar. And then uh, I would say the hangar as far as like actually. Ooh. Um, All right. There you go. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of visits, man. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of guys were signed at that place. <laughs> I was one of them. 
Um, yeah. Do you actually remember anything from the monkey bar, though? Uh, that's that's a conversation for another time. No, I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> you, you, you seldom remember your nights there, but you knew you knew you had an amazing time. <laughs> man, the next morning. Oh, forget about it. Next morning. Um, man, to wrap it up, though, the most important question I can ask you, considering everything you're able to do on the field, what you're doing now in life after being an athlete, still very successful and only continuing to build in the real estate space, what's the one best piece of advice that you'd give to young high school age kid that, that wants to you know, figure it out? How do they have a successful career? Um, I, I think put a major emphasis on the educational piece. Um, I think a lot of people put too much focus on to the athletic piece. <laughs> and, you know, the thing about life that we keep seeing is you never know, you know, what the hell is in store. So, you know, when you take the edu educational piece seriously and you find out how to translate that onto the field too, I think like some of my success, you know, was directly attributed to, you know, linking those two and not over focusing on you know, one thing in particular. So I think in general, life is all about balance. And when you're young, you're pursuing, you know, you, you look at guys on TV and everything, you don't you don't necessarily see everything that goes into, you know, those performances and all that stuff. And a lot of that, a lot of those things do have an education or a study piece, um, you know, about your craft. I, I think that most of the youth, I, the thing that I would tell them is, there's so much, like, the amount of extra time that you have to put in is astonishing. And don't think that, like, when you do the bare minimum, if you get in the habit of doing the bare minimum um, to get prepared, do what you need to do to be prepared, that, that's never going to be enough. So make sure you are putting in, if, if, if you had to do, you know, 20 papers, make sure you're doing 40 papers. Make sure you're getting, you know, you developing habits. Uh, I call them winning habits in your life that translate into, you know, whatever it is that you love doing. So it, life is all about habits and start those habits now. There you go. <laughs> so Jeremy, in closing, um, are you on social media? Where can people follow you? And, and again, what's the name of the restaurant? So, so right now I don't have a personal page, but my restaurant is called Soul, S-O-U-L, B as in boy, A-I-L-A, -A, Soul Baila, right? Soul and then Baila meaning dance in Spanish. So we have this, you know, great infusion, Afro-Latin infusion going on, amazing food. Um, we, we, we have some of the best drinks in the state. Well, I, I would say New England. And uh, <laughs> um, I, I always like to be a, a very confident person. So I would say, listen, our product, you know, all together, like I was saying, the balanced thing, we're probably the most balanced venue in New England, I would say. All right, well, there you have it. If, if you are so, listening to this, you're in the New England area. You got to get to Hartford, Connecticut. Soul Baila. Soul Baila. And you said it correctly, man. I, you know what? I wish I When you come in, drinks that in the you, house. That UMass <laughs> education. That you that state education, man, I tell you. <laughs> but yes, at Soul Baila. Follow us, at Soul Baila. And, and, and um... All my UMass alum, we, we do an amazing job taking care of anybody, any UMass alum listening, if you want to come down, we're right at 735 Weathersfield Avenue. We take care of our alumni. Please, please come down. Please, please spread the word. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to do my best to get it out there. Jeremy, thank you so much for taking the time, man. Appreciate you, bro. Much love.